Good morning, students. Let's uh, begin lecture. We're going to uh, continue talking about thermal concepts today and some practice that you will need for homework 15 tonight, uh, which will be ready by supper time, hopefully sooner, due on Thursday. Uh, then we'll talk about chapter 6 concepts, in other words, waves and try to work our way through that as much as we can. Uh, office hours tomorrow, 9 a.m. to noon, uh, right next door in physical science uh, building number room 158. Phase transitions, we talked about this a little bit last time. Let's uh, do a little bit of elaboration on that. A phase transition is where a liquid form of matter transforms to either a solid or a gas. Uh, the words that we use for the phase transition from liquid to solid is freezing or solidify. Uh, so for instance, a magma of molten lava flows like a liquid, but you wouldn't really say it freezes. You would say it solidifies. So those are two of the verbs there. Uh, from liquid to gaseous state, that's... Um, heating up, that's either boiling or vaporizing something. And if you made a cup of tea for breakfast this morning, like we did at my house, uh, you boil some water. Now, solid can also go to the other two phases of matter, liquid and gaseous. Solid to gaseous, that is known as sublimation. And that is something that CO2, carbon dioxide, ice, does. So when you go down to Publix and you buy a big block of CO2 ice, dry ice, carbon dioxide ice, uh, it will not leave a pool of water or a pool of liquid when it heats up. It'll go directly to a gas. That's why we call it dry ice. Okay, and the fancy word for that is uh, sublimation. Solid to liquid is what we call melting. And we know the melting point of various substances like gold and water, H2O. Gaseous to liquid, uh, that is like water vapor in the atmosphere. When it condenses into little droplets of liquid water, up in the atmosphere it forms clouds, a mist. A mist of teeny, teeny droplets that are so teeny they're lofted into uh, the atmosphere by the thermal updrafts. That's why thunderclouds get bigger and bigger. They build higher and higher. Uh, and at a certain point, uh, those droplets collide and coalesce into bigger droplets. And eventually, they're so big, they are not held up, above, uh, held up by the thermal drafts, uh, and they fall as rain. And if they're really high up, they'll, they'll fall as rain and then turn into ice, maybe. So uh, whenever you see a cloud, you're looking at uh, usually uh, liquid droplets of water uh, that are still held aloft. Uh, exception to that is a cirrus cloud, the, the really high, really wispy ones that look like strands of uh, hair, cirrus. Uh, those are actually ice, supposedly, way high up there. Gaseous to solid, okay, this is deposition, or the fancy word in the physics department is epitaxy, and, and it doesn't have anything to do with taxi cabs or Uber, it, it just means that you're slapping down something onto or epi another layer, epi means onto or above, okay, and so uh, when you have a, a gas, a really hot gas, uh, for instance, gold. You can vaporize gold at a really hot temperature in a furnace, and then it will be a gas of gold atoms. And if you shoot them through a, a gun at another surface, Lindsay, they will deposit and cool on contact and solidify into a thin layer. Many of your electronic components have a very thin layer of gold on them uh, because gold is a really good conductor, and it doesn't corrode, uh, but it's more expensive to get that. 
so that is uh, vapor deposition or uh, epitaxy, the fancy word. Now, I've rearranged these three circles. Uh, in this slide, they're not any particular orientation. Here they are. I put them uh, in order of energy rankings. A gaseous material is going to be, on average, higher energy than the liquid and solid, and the solid state of the same material is going to be the lowest of the energy states on average. And so that's one way to think about the, um, the three phases. You know, the different energy states um, that they occupy. Solid, you know, having s the, the molecules having so little kinetic energy that they're still stuck in a crystal lattice of some kind, either a diamond crystal or hexagonal crystals like ice uh, or any other kind of crystal that you may find. Another factor that comes into this is not just temperature and energy, Akeen, but also the pressure. And I have a couple interesting things to show you concerning uh, ambient pressure uh, and phase transitions. Uh, specifically for carbon dioxide. So let's look at carbon dioxide. Here's a couple slabs. Well, not a couple. I know that's about a dozen slabs more uh, of carbon dioxide ice. On the right is an image uh, of a close-up of carbon dioxide crystals. A pretty small micro, micro photograph of those. And the thing about dry ice, CO2 ice is, it actually can go to liquid, but only in high-pressure environments. So go ahead and jot down that concept. We call it dry ice because in normal atmospheric pressure at the surface of Earth, it goes straight from solid to a gas. It doesn't go through the liquid phase the way water does. Uh, but you can get um, solid to liquid to gas from CO2, in other words, you can get a CO2 puddle if the pressure is high enough. Now, to give you a, a handle on what I mean by pressure and high enough pressure, let's take a look at a few basic specs uh, on pressure. In the English system, uh, usually we rank pressure as uh, pounds per square inch, PSI. In general, a pressure is an amount of force per square meter of application. So if you have ever seen uh, a woman walking around in high heel shoes, the, the real pointy ones, uh, stiletto heels, and all the weight, you know, if you think about it, you know, I saw this movie, Jurassic World, a couple weekends ago, and it was amazing that the woman being chased by dinosaurs and scary monsters and everything, and she wore high, these high heel shoes the whole movie, and they, they never broke, and they, you know they never fell off her feet, and she saved the day and everything like that. It's pretty impressive. But anyways, high heel shoes. If you walk around in stiletto heels on a linoleum surface, you can actually put indentations into the surface. A friend of mine in the Air Force, he was a, a master sergeant, or I don't know what they call him in the Air Force, sergeant anyways, and his specialty was loading these big transport aircraft like the C-5A Galaxy, C-17 Globemaster. And he said that, you know, they, it is a huge machine, huge transport aircraft, hauls big, huge loads, you know, like a couple tanks and then about 100 men you know, from Florida to Germany, you know, in one hop. Amazing machines. But yet if a woman in stiletto heels walked up into the storage bay on that floor, she, he said she'd poke a hole right through it because it's, it's, it's meant to carry, it has to be light, but it's not meant to carry high pressures from uh, all the weight of a person concentrated onto less than a square inch of a stiletto heel, okay, and so stiletto, whereas you never see army men or marines or anything walking around in high heels shoes, 
They're usually walking around in combat boots. And combat boots have a lot of surface area, so the same weight on that surface area is a lot less, a lot less pressure. So uh, force per unit pressure, excuse me, force per unit area, think of high heel shoes versus combat boots. Or a big tank, a big tank rolling up into this aircraft, you know, huge tons, right? Very heavy. Uh, but they have these big wide tracks that they, you know, and that, you know, take up a lot of their, uh, well, they bear all their weight, but quite a bit of surface area. English system, uh, PSI, a scuba tank, typical scuba tank, 3,000 PSI rating. Okay, so that's the amount of pressure that they have to pressurize the air with, and that stores air in the tank. And they have other PSI ratings as well. Uh, air pressure in your car tires, 32 PSI maybe. Bicycle, 60, 80, you know, depending on the, bu the bicycle tire, you know, um, how much you know, air you put in. So PSI is, is uh, very common for a pressure rating system. Metric system, we basically count the number of newtons per square meter. And that is known as a Pascal after the French scientist from the 1600s or 17, 1700s, I guess, uh, named Blaise Pascal, B-L-A-I-S-E, Pascal, very smart guy. Um, so one Pascal of pressure is one Newton of force per square meter. So a human is, you know, a female walking around is maybe 50 kilograms, say. 50 times 9.8 is 490 newtons. 490 newtons um, concentrated onto a square centimeter of, of your foot, of high heel, stiletto heel, uh, is quite a lot of pressure, uh, a lot of newtons per square meter. Another metric unit is the bar. Now this doesn't have anything with have anything to do with the crossbar of the goalposts at the football stadium, uh, gymnastic parallel bars. It doesn't have anything to do with Louis Bar across the street, other side of Alfea. It has to do with bar, barometric pressure, the root word for weight, bar. And in the metric system, an abbreviation for 100,000 pascals is a bar. And the reason for that is that normal atmospheric pressure at sea level is in the area of 100,000 pascals of pressure pressing down on you and into you from all directions at the same time from the weight of the atmosphere. So per square meter of surface body, you're getting about 100,000 newtons. Um, so in, in weather science, atmospheric science, um, a lot of times they talk about the atmosphere. In other words, the pressure in terms of how many atmospheres. Okay, so 1.0 atmosphere, uh, which is the atmospheric pressure for um, a fair day, like today, at sea level, uh, that's 1.0 atmosphere. That is about 1,013.25 millibars. All right, now a millibar is what is the metric system uh, equivalent that they talk about on the Weather Channel. Um, in terms of Pascals, 113,000, uh, excuse me, 101,325 Pascals. So uh, now in, in the millibar system, that's a thousandth of a bar, uh, 100 Pascals. Uh, in the millibar system, uh, a lot of times they'll tell you, wow, that hurricane was really strong. It was, you know, and then they'll tell you the millibar rating. Recent huge storm that hit Mexico from the Pacific side uh, was Patricia, and Patricia was rated at 880 millibars. That is the lowest central pressure ever recorded uh, for a hurricane. Uh, and uh, it was pretty drastic. Now, it's kind of interesting. Uh, 880 millibars, that's, that's almost 900. 900 is almost 1,000. 
a thousand millibars is fair weather. So this is not a big deviation from fair weather. Pressure was. And make a note of that. This is uh, a little bit more than 10% deviation, 10% dip in the atmospheric pressure. And yet the effect on the weather is way more than 10%. It's catastrophically different. Okay, and that is one of the reasons that weather is so inherently difficult uh, to predict because of, uh, it's a fluid. You're trying to predict a fluid, and fluid has these uh, nonlinear effects, uh, small deviations with huge effects. Uh, one atmosphere in PSI, 14.695. Normally, you round it off to 15. Okay. So your, your tires, um, the way that your tires work, you have to have 32 PSI above air pressure, uh, you know, atmospheric pressure. So, your, you know, the amount of pressure in your tires is 47, you know, so if, you're, if, you're, if you pump it to 32, that's 32 in the tire plus another 15 atmospheric, so a total of 47. But the 40, but 15 of the past, 15 of the PSI inside the tire balance the 15 from outside. So the net outward pressure is 32 for your tires. Uh, another thing that you hear for atmospheric pressure is inches of mercury. Uh, over in uh, Europe, they would term it millimeters of mercury. And that's in a barometer. Barometric pressure, a normal day is 29.92 inches of mercury for one atmosphere. And Sometimes if you read older books, they'll talk about hurricanes that are way down at 26 inches of mercury. The barometer dives, and that is, you know, another way to rate a hurricane, a you know, dip in the inches of mercury. Now, the reason I want to show you that I'm going through these basic specs for pascals and, and atmospheres and stuff is because I want to show you a situation in which CO2 ice can go directly to liquid instead of directly to gas. CO2 ice can melt under the right pressure situation. And this diagram, try to copy this. Uh, this diagram shows the pressure conditions. Let's take a look at it. The left-hand side, the vertical scale is pressure inside the container of dry ice, uh, inside the container of CO2. And it's rated in kilopascals, K-P-A, that's kilopascals. Now right down here at the bottom on the left, it reads 101.4. Now that's not an FM radio station. That's about one atmosphere. All right, so down towards the bottom of your vertical scale, that's about where one atmosphere is. And then it goes up. And it's not a linear scale, it's a logarithmic scale, I think. So the, the bottom few millimeters of this graph are uh, fewer uh, pascals than the upper few millimeters. But be that as it may, you also have uh, a horizontal scale uh, from 194.7 at this point right here. You know, I have my, I can't even see my cursor. So where the first two dotted lines intersect, uh, sideways from 101.4, vertically from 194.7, okay, and then the, the temperature scale in Kelvin, capital K, goes all the way out to 304.2. Right now, there are three branches to this diagram, three solid lines, and they're actually curved. The first per part goes from the lower right up to about the middle, and they use the word triple point, where the three curves join together. Another branch of the curve goes almost straight up from there. It divides solid from liquid. And the third uh, branch goes kind of diagonally up and to the right, towards the upper right corner, and that divides gas from liquid and gas from solid. 
All right now this looks like a kind of a fancy graph but it really tells you the states if you have divided up your um, pressure temperature diagram correctly you'll have three zones the solid is everywhere to the left of that kind of gracefully curving upward line. It starts in the lower left and it goes up towards the middle at the top. Below that and to the right of it is CO2 gas in its gas state. So at those temperatures and pressures, CO2 will be at a gas, in a gas state. But kind of wedged in there from the upper right is the liquid phase. In other words, at those pressures, and temperatures, CO2 will be a liquid. Now we can't get to those pressures on any kind of uh, day here on Earth with normal weather because, um, as I said, this is atmospheric pressure all the way down here. And that is basically um, this transition from solid to, to gas. That's sublimation. So go ahead and add that to your diagram. This is where we are and on a normal day here in Orlando or anywhere else on the surface of the earth. Um, you're going to see CO2 crossing this line. And in fact, we're right down, you know, almost any day um, we're going to be uh, way down uh, in the bottom half of this graph. So uh, we're only going to see sublimation. However, if you're in a lab and you pressurize, um, above this point, 5.1 atmospheres, and see that over there to the, to the left, 510.2 kilopascals, that's the same as 5.1 atmospheres. And at, the pressure, at, at that pressure and at the temperature 216.8 uh, Kelvin, um, you're allowed to have um, solid, liquid, and gaseous CO2 all in the same state. Now think about that. Water doesn't behave that way in normal conditions. We have a, um, a freezing point for water, and at the freezing point, 32 Fahrenheit, 273 Kelvin, you can have liquid water and solid water um, and coexisting, and they'll stay that way if you're, you know, if you, if you, if you went into a, a, a frozen food locker, you know, one of those big walk-in freezers at at the grocery store where they store all the frozen food, if you took a glass of ice water and set it on one of those boxes of frozen food, it would stay that way. Because that stuff, if, if the temperature is set at 32 and your ice water is at 30, your water, your liquid water is 32 Fahrenheit, your ice is 32 Fahrenheit, that's just going to, it's never going to turn into water. It's not going to freeze solid. Okay? Because uh, water... Uh, is just happy as a clam, either phase, to be at that temperature. Above that temperature, it likes to be a liquid. Below that temperature, it likes to be a solid. Now, CO2 uh, is completely indifferent at this triple point. But above that, here's the transition that you can get from solid to liquid. This is the CO2 puddle at these high temperatures. Now that's 5.1 atmospheres up there or higher above that triple point. But if you do get up there, you know, with your lab equipment, and it's not hard to pressurize that. If you go down 33 feet under the ocean or under the water of a lake, that's equivalent to one atmospheric pressure. Every 33 feet down you go, just about, that's another uh, atmosphere. So if you go down 33 feet under the ocean, you have one entire regular atmosphere above you, and then that much water is equivalent to another whole atmosphere uh, pressing down on you. And so the water pressure down there is two atmospheres. Another 33 feet, three atmospheres. Another 33 feet, four atmospheres, and so on, all the way down to Davy Jones' locker. Okay, so it's not hard to get 5.1 atmospheres, except, but, but for us, we're, you know, even at the top of Mount Everest, and Mount Everest, it's cold up there, you know, so, um, uh, but it's very low pressure. It's, it's difficult for us to get this 
combination of high pressure and, and cold temperature where CO2 ice uh, is going to melt. So everything, you know, other than that is, is, uh, is going to be sublimation. All right, so, see, so this whole idea of phase transitions and, and where they happen uh, is affected by the pressure. And CO2 is a good example, carbon dioxide. Now, I want to work out a problem with you that we kind of started last Thursday, and let's finish it up now, and you'll be ready for some homework tonight, homework 15. Let's melt some H2O ice and then heat it up. So we're going to, it's like make it a cup of tea. Get your eye clicker too ready because I'm going to ask you some questions in just a minute. And those questions that you answer will be about specific heat and a few other concepts. Specific heat is the numerical rating that we can attach to a given substance that describes or encodes how easy it is to heat that substance up, gram for gram and Kelvin for Kelvin. So for instance, liquid water, it takes one calorie to raise a gram by one Kelvin. And so for liquid water, either a calorie for some, from sunlight or from a propane stove or any other source of heat energy, that's, you know, one calorie is going to raise a gram uh, of liquid water by one Kelvin. So that is why we write this equation down, C equals... 1.00 calories per gram Kelvin. And that is the customary symbol for specific heat, the letter C. It's also used by, the, by uh, physicists for the speed of light, so you have to be careful about the context. For specific heat, calories per gram Kelvin, some textbooks also are rated as calories per gram Celsius degree. But a Celsius degree is the same size as a Kelvin, so it's six of one and half a dozen of another. Does it make a difference? I always go grams Kelvin in the denominator. All right, now solid water, in other words, water ice, has a different property. It's a, it's a crystalline substance. It's strongly bonded together, All right? So it doesn't heat up the same. And in fact, it takes 0 0.5 calories per gram Kelvin to heat up for, for the specific heat of water. So if you have a gram of ice and a gram of liquid water, to raise it by one Kelvin, for the liquid water, it takes one calorie, but for the ice, it takes 0 0.5 calories. Okay. Now, the difference between solid and liquid is the phase change, okay? And, um, uh, and we're going to talk about the change of phase in just a minute. But when you, get, when you heat something up to the melting point for water, uh, 273 Kelvin, you know, that's your average temp, your, excuse me, that is your average kinetic energy measurement. Um, below that, your H2O molecules are going to be slow enough that they can bond together and stay bonded. Uh, and uh, so that's like, it's like slowing down and and so that you can talk to somebody. Okay, but if you're, if you're breezing by on your bike and they're walking, you can't really have an interaction. You say, hey, how are you doing? And then, then you're gone. All right. Now, these intermolecular bonds in the crystal or metallic lattice uh, or any other kind of solid structure, uh, they represent a lot of stored energy. Okay, so um, that's why it, it also takes energy to break it apart. And we will talk about that in a few seconds. Now, specific heat uh, is uh, a quantity for every substance and for every phase of every substance. So solid gold has a different specific heat than liquid gold. 
and gaseous gold, vaporized gold, has a different specific heat again, et cetera, et cetera. Water is the same. Now, here's some specific heats. You can start copying this down if you like. And by the way, on exam three coming up uh, towards the end of November, uh, you'll have specific heats to use and work with. They will be on the cover page. So a lot of the numbers that we are going to be talking about today, uh, there'll be a little mini table of that on the cover page or maybe in the question itself, something like that. So let's take a look at this data, and you're going to make some decisions about this. Uh, so make sure your clicker is ready because our next slide is a clicker question. Uh, liquid H2O, solid H2O, we already talked about. Glass. Okay, that means it takes, if you have a, a gram of regular glass, average glass, on average 0 0.20 calories to raise that, the temperature of that glass by one Kelvin. Ethanol. Now, this is a liquid. Ethyl alcohol. 0 0.58 calories per gram per Kelvin. Aluminum. 0 0.215. Gold, copper, silver. So you can see from this table that every substance is a little bit different. And it's interesting. Water is way up there at the top of the list. I, I haven't ranked it by by um, by value, I just wrote down a few substances that I I thought might be interesting, and uh, and then there's there's specific heats. Now I have a question for you, and this same table's on the next slide. Here's your question: uh, Which substance, gram for gram and Kelvin for Kelvin, is easier? Excuse me. Which one's harder to heat up? Go ahead and answer that. Think about what specific heat means. And you're going to have this table for a few minutes, so answer the question and then get back to copying the table down. It's It's good. I see a lot of people discussing it. That's exactly what I want. It's good. I had to yell at some of the students in the morning class because they wouldn't stop talking. But Okay, 15 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right, let's see what you guys voted for. Uh oh, we got some splaining to do. All right, here's your answers, um, and the correct answer is aluminum. Aluminum is the hardest one, and it looks like I caught a bunch of you guys napping. Uh, some of you voted for gold as harder to heat up. Now, how do you fit if, if a, a bunch of you answered incorrectly? So let's look at how you figure that out. What you do is um, you look at those numbers and you think to yourself, okay, gram for gram, Kelvin for Kelvin, that's how many calories I need. If I have one, if I have one gram of gold, one gram of aluminum, one gram of copper, one gram of silver, I need that many calories to raise it by one Kelvin on the Kelvin scale. So you look for the highest number. All right? And that is why aluminum wins on this one. All right, let's see if you can try another question. Which one's easier to heat up? This is the flip side.
15 seconds. Which one is easier? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All right. Ching. Most of you guys got that one right. Okay, and again, on this one, your basic principle is to look at, you know, to, to see which one is easier to heat up, which one requires the, the lowest number of calories. And it's got to be gold. All right. Now, in general, the heating up procedure uses this equation. Right? And this is the equation that allows you to figure out Q, the heat energy that it requires to heat up a certain amount of stuff, okay, so you have to have M, the mass, and I usually do these problems in grams, not kilograms, um, so you have to know how much you have, basically it's, it's all calibrated to grams, and then your specific heat, what have you got, so in other words, have you got metallic copper, metallic copper, the specific heat is 0 0.093 calories per gram Kelvin. And then the last thing you have to ask yourself is, how big is my heat up? In other words, am I going from 200 to 250 Kelvin, or am I going downward? Am I, am I doing a cool down? If you're doing a cool down, this should be a negative number. And a negative value for Q would indicate that you're ex you have to extract that much or you've lost that much heat energy. Okay? And so we're going to do an example of this in just a minute. Um, but this encodes the amount of heat that is required to change the temperature. So I call this the heating equation. Now the melting equation for H2O to go from solid to liquid is a little bit different. It just depends on how many molecules you have. In other words, how many kilograms of mass. And it depends on what substance you have and which phase transition you're trying to make. So if you're going, you better write this down. Capital L, I forgot to put it on the slide. Capital L stands for latent heat. Latent, capital L. L-A-T-E-N-T, -E latent. The latent heat uh, for melting, or the, as they call it, the latent heat of fusion for water is 80 calories per gram. And we'll go over that in just a minute. Here are some transition temperatures and latent heats of fusion and vaporization for three different metals. And you're going to have some clicker questions based on this table. But let's take a look at this table, and as you jot down gold, silver, and copper, let me ask you a few questions. Uh, gold. Which one has the higher melting point, gold, silver, or copper? Copper does. Okay, so jot down those melting points. And L subscript F in calories per gram. That's the latent heat of fusion. Now, the interpretation for that is uh, L subscript F, latent heat of fusion. That's the amount of energy that you have to exert to go in there and bust up all those crystals and break up the crystalline intermolecular bonds so that now it's a liquid. Because a liquid is weakly cohesive. But a crystal can be really tight. You know, like a diamond is really strong. The hardest stuff there is, right? So diamond has a really strong metallic, uh, uh, crystalline bond. And uh, it takes energy. You've got to exert force to pull them apart. So a force and a delta X, that's work. And that's what this encodes, gram for gram. OK, 
Okay, boiling points are similar. And notice that this fourth, uh, excuse me, the fifth column, fourth column of numbers, the latent heat of vaporization, um, that's what it takes to go from liquid to a gas. And it is quite a bit bigger than solid to a liquid. So going from weak cohesion of a liquid to absolutely zip zada, uh, for a gas requires a lot. Now, what this means, you guys, is that when you heat up ice, you know, you have a propane burner underneath it, and you're trying to heat it up, and you're heating the ice, you know, so it's, it might be at 270 Kelvin, and you heat it up 3 Kelvins, now it's at the boiling po or the melting point, but then the temperature is not going to change for a while, because you have to put in this much energy to break apart the ice and make it into to a liquid. When it all has become a liquid, then it will raise its temperature again, but as a liquid. Right? So uh, let me ask you a question here. Now this is related to the table. Question number three on the clicking. Uh, which solid is harder to melt, gram for gram? So I'm asking you a melting question. So the last two columns, you don't have to worry about those. Click in your question. 30 seconds. Click in your answer and then finish copying if you still have to copy. Fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Nice. Most of you got that copper. All right. Uh, next question. Question. Oh. By the way, if you didn't get it right, this is what you have to think about, that every, every gram of copper requires 32 calories to, to, uh, to melt, okay? Versus gold, uh, only 15.4 calories, and silver, only 21.1. So copper, gram for gram, needs more energy. All right, next question. Which solid has tougher metallic bonds between its atoms? I want you to think. And let me start this question. Okay, you can click in your answer now. Dude, how's your foot? Yo. He's thinking. You're thinking. Sorry, I didn't mean to disturb you. How's your foot doing? Okay. Still on crutches? Good. All right. You're back to your disco uh, mania. Good. So you, so you you got all your leisure suits pressed and everything, and yeah, those hot leisure suits. Okay, ten seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right. Let's see what you guys got. Oh oh, we got some splaining to do. All right. Now, it appears that a lot of you voted for copper. But guess what? This is the right answer. I thought, but, but now listen, it's not an easy question. This is a brain burner for the day. Now, 
if you go gram for gram, yes, copper is. But if you're talking about the bond between atoms, how do you know how many copper atoms you have in a gram? You know, so, and, and heck, gold, that's really heavy, right? I mean, it's, I mean a gold bar, I mean, you got to, you know, that's a, that's a lot to carry. So gold might have, you know, fewer, at, well, gold does have fewer atoms in each gram than copper. So you really need to know the mass per uh, atom, and we don't have it on this table. But what table does have that information? The periodic table. And that is where we're heading with a lot of this stuff. So jot down this. If you got caught out on this problem, which is most of you, 95% uh, of you guys got caught out on this. It's all right. Um, jot down. You also need to know how many atoms per gram. And then you can figure out from this latent heat how tough those bonds are. Now, I want to do a, a calculation with you. Oh, it's I, I already I already said it. It's just just the fact that you have to. Uh, it's just the fact that you have to know the mass per atom. Okay. So let's do, a, let's do a, a fairly simple calculation, and then I'll give you a clicker question with a little tougher one. Uh, we're going to melt a small piece of ice and then raise its temperature as liquid water. So here we go. Now, in this kind of problem, this is known as the heat melt heat problem. We're starting at an initial temperature of my choosing, 266 Kelvin. So that's a little bit below the freezing point. And we want to get to a final temperature of 275 Kelvin. And that is going to be a little bit above the freezing point, above the melting point. So what we've got to do here is heat the ice from 266 up to 273. And then we've got to melt all of the ice at 273, gram for gram. And once we've done that, we have to heat the liquid water from 273 up to 275, another 2 Kelvin. So let's get it all uh, figured out here. So our first calculation is a heating. And I'm going to do both of the heat ups. Okay, so I'm going to heat the ice and I'm going to heat the water, the liquid water, and then we'll do the melting third. So this is where we've got 10 grams of water. So that's right here. Okay, 10 grams of water in the first parentheses. And then in the middle parentheses is the specific heat of solid water, 0 0.50 calories per gram Kelvin. And then I'm going from 266 initial temperature up to 273, the melting point. So that's plus 7 Kelvin. Right? So it's a heat up process. Now multiply that out. Let's see, 10 times 0 0.5 times 7 is uh, 35. Question? 275? Yeah, that's my final temperature. Because we're heating up solid water. We're, this, this problem requires you to heat up solid water, ice, then melt it, and then heat up the liquid. All right? So we heat from the initial temperature up to the melting point as ice. Then we melt the ice at the melting point. And then we've got water after that, additional energy, and then we heat the liquid water up to my final, 275. So I've set just two numbers. I just dreamed them up, 266 and 275. I could have gone up to 305 if I want, you know, or 295. But for this one, 
my first heating transition or my first heating process, I have to go up to the board, to the melting point seven Kelvin. Uh, Sarah. But you're not going to two. You're not going to two seventy five. You're going to two seventy three. That's the final temperature. That's after we melt it. So in the middle here is is my phase transition temperature, 273. Don't forget about that. That's what makes this a little tricky. Deborah. So where do you find 273? Where do I find 273? 273 is, is a property of water. That's the freezing point of water. And I chose two temperatures, one above and one below. Fairly close, so it's not a big calculation. Easy to do. And that's what we're doing. Another question? Yes. Yes, for the final delta T, and that's what we're going to do right now. Q2, this is the second heat up. So now I, I'm, I'm skipping over the melting. We'll do that next. But this is the second heating up. And, and the answer is yes. Um, delta T here is 275 minus 273. See it, Sarah? Yeah, so this is 2 Kelvin. So I'm going all the way up, but I do it in stages. I heat ice, then I heat liquid water. All right? And in between, I have the melting. All right now, melting, we've got to deal with. Anyways, if you do these two calculations, 10 times 0 0.5 is 5. 5 times 7 is 35. So the first heat up process requires 35 calories. The second heat up process requires, let's see, 10 times 1 is 10, 10 times 2 is 20. So another 20 to get me up to 275 is water. But in between those two, I have to melt 10 grams. All right? So the change of phase requires work. And as I mentioned, for every gram, it takes 80 calories to bust up those uh, intermolecular bonds and melt it. Right? Now, 80 times 10 is 800. And it's kind of interesting. For this process, most of the energy budget is in the melting. You know, and melting requires a lot of energy for water anyway. So let's put it all together. My total energy budget uh, for this procedure is 35 plus 800 plus 20. Heat, melt, heat. So for the heat, melt, heat process, I heat with 35 calories. I melt with 800. And then I heat the liquid with 20 calories more, and I get to my target temperature. So my total budget is 855 calories. All right. Now, on the next clicker question, you're going to have to do a calculation, but however, you're going to have different initial temperature, different final temperature. But still and but we're still working with water, so you still have that intermediate 273 because that's always the same. All right, so you have two delta T's, and then you have a different mass. So it's going to be a little trickier. Let's go ahead and, and start it. Heat, melt, heat. Hit the refresh button because it's a numeric calculation. Here we go. You have a 120-gram chunk of ice up in Greenland. Initial temperature, 260. Your final temperature for drinking water is 300 Kelvin, all right, a little bit warmer. So your delta, you have two delta T's from 273 down to 260, and then from 300 down to 273, all right? And you have a different mass, and you know M comes into both heating qu questions and into the latent heat, the melting. So heat, melt, heat. Go ahead and do that. And go ahead and work with your neighbor, and that'll be good. 
and I'm going to walk around a little bit since I no longer have a USB mic. Specific heat of solid water. Okay. Ice. Yeah, it's easier to heat up. Solid ice is easier to heat. Solid water is easier, easier to heat up than liquid water. Liquid water is really hot. Yeah. 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 So you got two delta T's here. Okay. On 20. Okay. Now you need a delta T here. What's your delta T? Two different delta T's. Because your your final is 300. So, okay, yes. Mass, okay, so instead of 10, it's going to be 120. Okay, ice, still use that. That's specific heat of ice. Mm -hmm. And then this is going to be a different delta T. Yeah, because it's it's 273 minus 260. Okay, it's always it's always the difference between the starting temperature and the freezing point, and then the second delta T is from the yeah, because it's water, because we're doing water. Okay, so then the second delta T is from 273 up to the final. Okay, and that's going to be liquid water. No, no, from 273 up to 300, from the from the melting point up to 300. What's that? Yeah, yeah, because you got a lot of grams. You have 10 times, 12 times as many grams, and a bigger delta T. So yeah, you're gonna get thousands of calories. Let me see what you got. Don't be blabbing the answer out though. Okay. Hold on. That's a property of water. Yeah, every time you every every block of water ice the world over, eighty calories per gram to melt it. Yeah, that's a, it's not a given. It's a property of water. So and that so that would be like on the cover page in a table of specs. That you need for, for calculations. That's good. I think I think that's I saw something else with that. Now you got a second one. That's right. 1.00 here, and then delta. I'll be next another. Mm-hmm. You should. 27. Yeah. And, and then the melting 80 times 120. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sure. Hey. Good. That was 80 times the mass. It's always 80. It's a property of water. So, you know, if I was using, if we were doing copper or something like that, you know, that it would have a different number. But for water, it's always 80 to melt. Okay, I'm going to cut around. Toes, don't let me step on your feet. My big feet. Sparkly shoes. Very nice. 
Yeah, Dr. B. Um, yeah. Earlier you had like three numbers that you added. It's the um, total. The total energy budget, yeah. The yeah. heating, the first heating. Like that's what I got. Like this is the first one, this is the second one. So and then, this, the, then the, the middle one, the melting, is always 80, 80 calories per gram times how many grams you've got. And that's the that's where you have to break up the crystal bonds and make it into a liquid. And it's 80 calories for every gram. So if you have 120, just multiply, you know, 80 times 120. And it's going to be a big number. Where am I getting the 80 times 120 from? 80 calories for every gram of H2O. 80 cal. This is like the 19th time somebody's asked me. So in general, every time you're working with water, 80 calories per gram to melt it. So if you have one gram, 80 calories. Two grams, 160. Three grams, 240. Blah de blah de blah. All the way up to 120 grams. Yeah. So. Yeah, basically. Total energy budget. Yeah, and then add up the... So you have three numbers to add up. That looks vaguely reminiscent. All right, let me go back up here. 30 seconds. Yeah. Yeah, you'll have a table. I don't expect you to memorize that kind of stuff. Although some of it you'll memorize just because you use it all the time, but but in general you'll have it. Fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Whoa. We got a lot of geniuses around here. 13,620. Raise your hand if you got that. Sweet. Uh, hey, what was 4820? Was that the sum of the two heating? All right. Uh, so your homework 15 is going to contain that. Now, um, you'll also have some concepts. But I want to go through some wave... stuff from Chapter 6. So chapter 6, and I've actually started making highlights in chapter 6 as well. Last time I mentioned uh, a, an example of convection, the Yellowstone mantle plume. Uh, we know that there's a plume of hot molten lava boiling up from the core of the earth right underneath Yellowstone. And the reason we know that is because we can study the seismic waves, the, the earthquake, basically it's, it's like sound waves from the earthquakes. And there's tons of little teeny tiny earthquakes around the Yellowstone area all the time. I used to live out there, I know. They're not big, but if you have a good seismograph, you can measure them. And what, it's just like sonar. If you figure out, if you're trying to track down a Russian sub, you analyze the sonar waves as many as you can. You figure out the range. These guys do it in three dimensions, and they figure out, you know, wherever the sound waves are going slowly, that means the rock is hotter because it's not as solid, and therefore the waves slow down. And that tells them where the plume is. So they have this lovely plume that they've tracked down underneath Yellowstone. Question. Uh, no, you need to know this stuff. 
Okay, so let's keep going. All right. So let's get some basic specs for waves down. And we'll try to do as much as we can and then dismiss in a few minutes. And then we'll take it up again on Thursday. And so you want to read into Chapter 6. Start reading into Chapter 6 now. Um, first concept, I can't overemphasize. Waves are not like particles. They transport energy and momentum, but they themselves are not a piece of water. You know, we get waves that start in uh, the Cape Verde Islands off the coast of West Africa, and they come ashore here in, in uh, Cocoa Beach, but it's not water from, from, at, from the Cape Verde Islands that's making it over here. That's still over there. But the energy and momentum from that storm over there has transported across uh, the ocean. And for that reason, they're not easy to localize. All right? So you can't say the wave is right there and it's not there. And it's not that, you know, it's very tough to say, well, where does the wave start and another one begin? It's kind of, right? And waves behave way differently than a Newtonian particle. So by Newtonian particle, think of baseball, parabola, on the way to the outfield, one-half GT squared, all that stuff. Yeah, Sir Isaac Newton put a lock on that. We've got that on lockdown. we got it squared away. Waves do way different things. One thing that they do is called diffraction. And that is when they go through a barrier, um, if there's a gap in a barrier or an edge, they do this. Look at this. Look at this image. These, these waves down here on the bottom, the waves are going from bottom to, towards the top. When they go into the barrier here, this really dark bar across the bottom, uh, it has a gap in it. When they get into the gap, they keep going. But it's as if there are a lot of little wavelets in there. And that they start a whole new wave train. And because of that, it seems to curve. The wave starts to curve simply because it's interacted with this gap. Now, the simple wave equation, and I might put this on one simple equation on the test or on the homework. I'm not done with the homework yet, not quite. Uh, v equals lambda f. Lambda is the wavelength, f is the frequency. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that on Thursday. Um, start reading into Chapter 6. Homework 15 will be running uh, in a short while by supper time latest. You're dismissed. I'll see you on Thursday. Good work today.